Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back to another episode. And today's show is just all about players who aren't good enough to start <laughs> in the NBA, apparently. Uh, our, our friends, Jay Kyle Mann and Sirit Zoe, they, they have a wonderful little podcast on The Ringer. And they did this really cool... We we're going to talk about uh, bench players and six men. And they did this great dive into the history of the Six Man Award. And they brought up something that has always been like a curiosity to me about the Six Man Award, which is it is an award that acknowledges the best player who is not good enough to start. So, so like if you're good enough to start, you would never win this award. But then once you get just not good enough to start, if you come off the bench, you can win the award. And that's obviously a bit of a dichotomy because teams will you know, put their fourth best player on the bench if they have redundancy or things like that. But it's just, it's always been a funny award to me. And then in discussing the bench players this season with all the injuries and the the quote unquote load management where players are trying to, you know, like stay rested and um, things like that. There's so many players around the league that we looked at, Cody, who've started like 15 or 20 or 25 games. They're in the lineup, they're out of the lineup. So we're just trying to figure out like, where's the line anymore? Who qualifies for six man of the year? And so the spirit of today's show is to discuss the bench, best players off the bench. And my, my fascination with this at this point in time is really guys who aren't volume scorers, guys who aren't in that Lou Williams, um, Jordan Clarkson, uh, Jamal Crawford, you know, like come off the bench and just be the highest scoring player. Jordan Clarkson won six man of the year when he was the seventh man in the Utah rotation. It, it just will never get old to me. He was literally, he came off the bench after Joe Ingles. Joe Ingles obviously started when need be, when one of the starters went down because he was a very valuable player. He finished the game in a lot of lineups, but Clarkson was the higher scorer. Clarkson won six man of the year. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm I'm feeling chilled out. I'm feeling mellow. How, how are you? Yeah, I I think I made a comment before. I'm like, I'm going to try not to fall asleep during this podcast. But once we start getting into the six men, Ben, like just like the best six men, once I'm out on the court, once, once the warm-ups are off and I toss them back behind me on the scorer's table, I'm awake, baby. As soon as I cross that court, I'm ready to go. But one thing, one thing I want to make a comment about is you said the players just aren't good enough to start. But I think something that, that both Kyle and Sierra did a great job of pointing out is that throughout history, there have been a few players that certainly were good enough to start. You know, the Manu Ginobili, Bobby Jones, these guys easily could have started, but for whatever tactical reason the coach decided, maybe it's like Manu Ginobili where it's almost like we need to rein in some of this energy. We need to keep you down and bring that off the bench. Uh, there's some other reason that they came in that has to do that is beyond just their skill level. Well, that's part two to me, which segues us into our conversation today. Do coaches do this anymore? Is there anyone around the league who is kind of tactically deployed against second units or, you know, they want to be part of the best lineup at the end of the game or when things, you know, if stuff really hits the fan in the playoffs, it's the, it kind of feels like um, maybe as a, as a not so great analogy, the Warriors with their death lineup, they would go to that when they really needed to go to that, right? Like you knew those were going to be their five best players with Iguodala. But I mean, that's many years in the past at this point. So I was actually wondering, you know, is there anyone around the league in the last few seasons that has been used this way that, that is clearly part of a team's quote unquote best five? And he himself is a good player, maybe the third or fourth best player on the team. I mean, historically, John Havlicek was definitely one of the third, three or four best players on the Celtics. Ginobili, of course, was probably, uh, Ginobili was probably the second best player and sometimes the best player on the Spurs. But there have been guys that have existed in in between states, like Detlef Schrempf in the 90s, won a couple six man of the year awards for the Pacers. He was in and out of starting lineups, both in Indiana and in Seattle. Uh, and then I think in Portland, I can't remember if he was a consistent starter when he, when he played in Portland there on that 2000 team that lost to Kobe and Shaq in the Western conference finals. So, you know, I don't know, is there anyone today that fits that bill or are we really just talking about 
sort of the the next tier of players after typical starters. So I think what's interesting is there were a couple of players that when I initially pulled some numbers and were looking at the game started versus just general games played, there were a couple of guys that I thought were going to be discussed today. But recently, at least in the last like 20, 25, 30 games, the coach has flipped and made them start. So like Walker Kessler, for instance, he was coming off the bench at the beginning of the season. Uh, Daniel Gafford for the Wizards, two guys like strong rim protectors, strong finishers at the rim. I thought we were going to be talking about them. But when you actually see like the trends, they've been starting a lot more recently. Even like after the trade, Vanderbilt, the Lakers are like, you know what, Jared Vanderbilt, we like that energy. Let's bring you off the bench. And they're like, actually, no, you're just you're just flat out really good. Let's let's start you because you're valuable. Uh, I think one guy we'll talk about today that is maybe the closest to fitting that bill is Tyrese Maxey. And I mm. think there's an aspect of him coming off the bench just because uh, DeAnthony Melton sort of brings a different look when you have James Harden and Joel Embiid out there. So I think that's probably the closest thing we have to, like, we have a better puzzle piece for what we have as opposed to just, like, raw impact on a team. Yeah, that's a great call because, obviously, he was starting. Um, and then if you move him to the bench, he gets to play against second units. He gets to stagger, quote-unquote stagger, if you will, with James Harden as the primary ball handler. And then in his case, he's a young player. So I think getting him those kinds of reps at primacy against second units or saying, you know, with the second unit, this is more of your time to have the ball. Yes, sometimes Embiid might be out there with you, sometimes not. But we're going to shake it up where instead of being the starter and the third best offensive player, our sort of third primary weapon out there who can create and attack and do the things that we've talked about with, with Maxi this year, you go to the bench, and then by the time we hit the fourth quarter, we'll see what we need to put out there in terms of lineups. But yeah, I think that's that's at least scanning here. That seems to be the only one that really jumps out like that to me, whereas the Celtics have a couple great bench players, but uh, that's because they have a, a gluttony of, of uh, riches in the starting lineup because their, their top five is just so good. Yeah, there's a couple of teams actually where – I think they have a player that has a sixth man of the year person we might talk about, but the secret to a couple of them is that there's actually multiple players. I think the Grizzlies come up too, where I think immediately someone might go to Brandon Clark, might go to Tyus Jones, but also Santi Aldama, like coming off the bench. Those are three guys that like give them really valuable minutes off the bench. So it almost feels weird talking about one of them being like, this is the Grizzlies sixth man, when in actuality, they kind of have a solid eight man rotation there. And it's, it's almost hard to differentiate that. So I think that and like the Celtics rotation, like we were talking about, I think that complicates this conversation just a little bit where it turns into like, who's just the best bench player because it's weird to think that the best bench player might actually be like the seventh man like you were saying with Clarkson so uh yeah I don't know how that fits into it yeah and the Celtics uh, I feel like we're even getting cheated out of someone with the Celtics because Rob Williams missed a ton of time so those starts maybe went to Derek White so Derek mm -hmm. White has started 52 games this season um, but Rob Williams doesn't qualify because he's only played 27 games as of recording this, but he's started 17 of them, and we expect Rob Williams to start more games than he comes off the bench, and that's that's the qualifying number for six, uh, six man of the year. You have to come off the bench more games than you start, and so if you play the whole season, it's 41 starts, and you're, you're disqualified from that award, and in this case, you know, like Williams has played – 27 games he started 17 but even with maxi the number of games he's come off the bench now puts him back in qualification whereas walker kessler as you mentioned and they're, they're headed the other way i think kessler's up to like 28 starts or something in 50 something games played so he's he's going to essentially disqualify himself and we won't really be able to get into it today the one thing i do want to say about those guys is very interesting to think about players coming off the bench like that as drop big men as rim protectors, right? As as guys who maybe in other situations and certainly their teams ultimately felt this way, like you would just expect those guys to start and then the small ball lineup would be the curveball off the bench or something. Walker Kessler, uh, one more thing about him. He's averaging only 21 minutes a game this season, but a lot of that is just from rookie lag early in the year coming off the bench. And since he moved to the starting lineup, he is at 28 minutes per game. 
it's interesting. I'm actually trying to scan here. I was really hoping both of them would have made it. First of all, because I just I want to talk about Daniel Gafford forever because that dude is is just so much fun to watch. But when you go into both of their profiles, you go to the thinkingbasketball.net profile, and you pull up all of their statistics. You have it in this nice little chart. You pull up your coffee or your chai tea or whatever your, your drink of choice is, and you're like, ah, these numbers are really fun. Both of them have these impact metrics that are like, this dude should not be coming off the bench. This is really good, so I'm glad to see that they made it. But the reason I wanted to talk about them is because in terms of like a sixth man that you want on a playoff rotation, do you actually want a drop big being in that sixth man position? But now that both of them are out, Ben, I'm looking at this like, you know, this query that we pulled up here that has 60 some odd players that kind of that that counted with these games started. I think they're the only two drop bigs that were in there. Like, there's other big men, but I, ca- I count them as more like flexible bigs that can do just a little bit more on defense. I, I don't know, Ben. It's Is it strange? Do you find it strange that there's not many drop big men that come off the bench? Boy, um, I don't know if I find it strange because it, let's think this through. Does it make sense? We saw this in Boston last year. Like, if you can do it, I think having a base defense that's built around a a quote unquote traditional drop big man. And when we say that here, we're talking about less versatility. Like that's the main pitch that this guy throws defensively. You want a bit he's a he's a rim protector, he's a shot blocker, and so you want a kind of base or quote unquote vanilla scheme built around his size, built around this this drop coverage where you don't have to commit to a ton of complex help. You don't have to commit to constantly having a third guy involved in defending the pick and roll. I guess it makes sense that you would start with that and wait for a team to force you out of it. Now, as I say this, it's 2023. We've done a ton of content, had a ton of discussions lately on this show and on the YouTube channel about all the offensive tactics taking place, about all the skill and shooting on the court, all the spacing, all the offensively slanted lineups. And so the defending champion, Golden State Warriors, who we know are struggling, who we've talked about all year, um, they seem to be moving like Kavon Looney in and out of the starting lineup, depending on the opponent. So I'm not sure this is actually going to hold up going forward. I, I, I don't know. It makes sense to me on one hand to start with that and have a player like that starting in the game and then you can swap them out as needed. But maybe maybe there's no reason to do it. I, I don't know. Is it an arbitrary decision that coaches are making? Or do you think we're going to see more of this? Like, well, some nights we might want Valanchunas and Looney to start out there with their size and Steven Adams, but other nights you guys just go to the bench and play 12 minutes when you can, when there isn't a team of speedster shooters out there stretching you out. I think I'm trying to put on my coach's hat right now to try and think philosophically why this might be the case. You need a I scarf think, for that. That's that's the key is to go with a coach's scarf. Listen, an ascot. I don't know. I don't know if all of you that are listening ever go to the More Thinking Basketball YouTube channel ever, but this is the one time you should because Ben's scarf that he is rocking, like this dude just finished coaching at the Premier League, sitting down at a pub just talking some hoops. I mean, this is just an immaculate like sweater scarf situation. I'm 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 honestly blown away, Ben. I, who, how can we continue the show after <laughs> after this description? I thought you were going to get into your Hawaiian shirt. I think we were talking about six men and 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 come on looney yeah so uh, putting on my coach's hat without the scarf unfortunately you're gonna have to take that mantle mantle today when you have your starters i think there's an aspect of like you want your starters to be like these are our guys right this is my squad that i go out there with we have our system that we run we know exactly how it's going to go and not that it's inflexible but this is the lineup i roll out there whereas like i feel like the ideal sixth man almost brings an element of like randomness spontaneity this is a guy's gonna come in sort of like a pinball and it's just gonna like kind of blow everything up they can kind of change the game in a different way and i think when you have a drop big man that's pretty uh you can see that coming you know how to scheme against it it's like oh they're drop bigs coming in that means that we're gonna switch to this style when it comes in but when you have someone like manu ginobili comes in <laughs> i don't know how we're gonna guard this because this guy's just like all over the place or you bring in somebody that can just like control the floor somebody that's strong defensively can move the ball that brings in an element of that randomness that's really hard to scheme against. So I feel like the ideal sixth man isn't somebody that's like super schemable. It's somebody that can that sort of changes some things up in terms of what the starting lineup brings. I suppose if 
You were really versatile as a player. You would always be in the starting lineup unless you were just on a completely stacked team, right? If you could, if you're six foot seven or six five, and you can essentially play quote unquote one through four positions, and you can guard different positions, and you can defend in different schemes, and you're not a liability, and you could pass a little and shoot a little, you could do all that stuff. Then you probably are more likely to be a starter where maybe the best players coming off the bench, even in today's game, naturally have to have more of a, to go back to the baseball metaphor, like a one pitch or two pitch kind of thing that they bring to the table. Does that, I'm just talking out loud here. Does that seem reasonable? I was with you. I have no clue what this one, two pitch situation is like everything up to that sounds good, but you lost me on the middle. Okay. Let me, let me, let me explain that. Cause we also have a lot of international listeners who might not be into baseball. Um, Essentially, like in baseball, great pitchers will be able to throw different types of pitches to really throw batters off. So you can have a fastball, you can have a curveball, you can have a changeup where it looks like a fastball and it goes really slow. If you're really nasty, you can have a slider, which is a fast pitch that kind of moves and ducks. So there are great pitchers that only rely on like one or two pitches. It's more of a one-dimensional kind of approach so you know in this case going back to our idea of drop bigs like that's what you provide you're a rim runner and lob threat on offense and you fit in this particular kind of coverage and provide a ton of value defensively if you're of the ilk that won a ton of six men of the year awards in the last decade or so you come off the bench and you are a gunner you, we're going to give you the ball. You're going to shoot a lot. We don't mind that you're low efficient. Um, maybe we do, but what else can we do? And then you, you're you going to be a guy who can take some primacy on offense. Maybe you can provide a little playmaking and you score a ton. That's still kind of one pitch because, as you know, with some of these players, when you get to the playoffs, not a lot of defensive versatility, not a lot of value on the defensive end. Um, and maybe they're not even you know, flexible in terms of how you could use them in an offensive scheme outside of just being big scorers on the ball. I think, and maybe, maybe I'm, I'm too stuck in this ideal situation because, you know, the Warriors are just supremely talented in their run. But when I think of like an ideal six man, I want like Andre Iguodala coming off the bench, right? Somebody that's going to come in, just like blows it all up defensively, can move the ball. You don't necessarily want him running an offense, but you know, he can drive and kick and he'll hit the every clutch corner three that ever needs to be made out on the court. And, you know, maybe it's just because, like I said, the Warriors were just so good. Like, he's not going to start over Kevin Durant or prime Clay Thompson. Uh, so maybe I'm, I'm clouded by, like, the versatility that someone like Iggy brought to the table. Yeah, I I, I thought he was a great, great six-man in the, in the lineage of uh, Mount and Ginobili and Bobby Jones and some of those other great players. Kevin McHale was, was a six-man for a while before he switched into the starting lineup permanently. Um Let's talk about some of the the best six men today. So, or best reserves, because as you said, some of these teams have multiple options. Uh, let's start with a guy who did not play last night. Can we do that? <laughs> oh, you know, man. We're not warming up to it. We're just going for it. No, I, I, it's really interesting to me. So Grant Williams is someone that I think you and I both think fairly highly of because of his defensive chops and the fact that as a three and D player, he makes what 42 or 43% of his wide open threes. I mean, he's a good shooter. He's, he takes a ton from the corner. Cody, you know, as a Bucks fan last year, you know, what did he hit seven in game seven or something like that? So this is not a guy that isn't capable of providing value and fitting at the highest levels of basketball we see these days, even though, of course, he's limited offensively. Um, But I don't know why did why why wouldn't like when would you not play him? That that was I guess Joe Mazzula after the game said it was because of matchups. But I'm only bringing this up in the context of let's 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 think about what we just said about versatility or certain situations where a type of player um, is going to play versus a starter is going to play all the time in theory. Grant Williams against the Bucks two weeks ago plays 47 and a half minutes. <laughs> now, is it, like, was that purely because it was the hospital Celtics? Because it was the hospital Celtics. It was, you know, everyone was out. It was one of these games where they had Mike Muscala and Sam Hauser and, and Blake Griffin, right? 
But then maybe in a game where everyone's healthy, uh, the game against the Knicks two nights ago, you have the the standard lineup and Grant plays 16 minutes off the bench. And then he gets a, a DNP, does not play because of the coach's decision. For me, it's a little strange only because of how good he is defensively, but I think it might plug into the conversation we're having. I'm going to be intellectually vulnerable with you right now because this is this is genuinely something that like I, I kind of backtracked a little bit on my own beliefs because you know I don't think he's like a wrecker on defense he's one of these guys that fits really well in positionally because you know like we were talking about he's playing against the 76ers and in the same quarter he's defending James Harden and Joel Embiid right like he's literally the primary defender on them you go back to a previous game against the Grizzlies he's the primary defender on a few possessions on Ja Morant and Jaron Jackson that is incredible defensibility to bring. However, it's not like he's he's blowing up actions with his like quick passing lane jumps, right? He's got good hands and he can disrupt things. He's not going to slot down and rim protect like some of the best, but it's still somebody that like is clearly valuable on defense. However, when you just like, you know, I do love my spreadsheets, Ben, and the all-in-ones don't necessarily love him, right? They, it comes up as being, you know... He, he's somewhat of a negative in some of these all-in-ones. You go into Twitter and you look up Grant Williams after he gets the DNP and Celtics Twitter is ablaze with being like, oh, finally we're realizing that, that Grant Williams is useless. And it's weird to me because I'm like, okay, like I watch a good amount of ball, Ben. But like if you're a dedicated Celtics fan or you're a dedicated whatever team fan, you probably watch more of that team than I do. So I'm like, am I missing something? What am I not getting? Because Grant Williams brings to the table everything that I would want from a high level sixth man that's gonna, like I said, come in, can defend anyone, can hit open threes, doesn't really have a developed driving game, but isn't, like, completely useless. I, I, I don't know, Ben. What, what do you think with all this conversation? I I think we have to be careful about uh, trusting the partisan Twittership out there. Because <laughs> sometimes they get, st- they get stuck on things. They get stuck on things. And so if you're a non-offensive player they will fixate and get stuck on, uh, and I'm just speculating here, but I've seen this happen many times. They'll get stuck on the fact that, you know, he can't punish an advantage or uh, he doesn't create as well, or maybe there's some uh, possessions that stand out in your head where he turns it over. And then the local faithful, they get very, the knives come out, right? And it's hard to see unless you forget watching games, unless you study film and understand what's happening. Sometimes it's hard to see what a guy brings to the table defensively but I thought you were going to flip it and say like you're intellectually vulnerable are you not normally intellectually vulnerable (laughs) on this show are you intellectually locked up you know I I would like to think I'm vulnerable but this is the first time where I think I'm going to be like I'm genuinely confused about this usually I'm pretty confident this is what I'm trying to say usually I feel like I could have been pretty confident about some of the takes I have this is one of those where I'm like I'm kind, of, I'm kind of shaky right now, Ben. My, I've, I'm in my head. I'm at the free throw line worried about everyone waving in the background. Well, well, that's the direction I thought you were going to go in here um, in, with this issue with Grant in terms of like the coach being the one who disagrees with you. That's where you start to feel mm-hmm. like sometimes it's just very clear. And, and you know, you watch, you watch Jared Vanderbilt for two years, and then he joins the Lakers, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why is, why is he playing 12 minutes a game coming off the bench? This makes no sense. And, but then, of course, that often gets validated very quickly because one thing that I think, going back to like fans and, and Twitter arguments and things like that, if a guy's really good, He's just, I can't think of a situation in NBA history where he's just going to be benched when he's really good. Now, some guys are benched and they would be great eighth men instead of the guy who's playing. That does absolutely happen. Um, but when a guy's that good, he's he's going to find a way. Uh, you know, uh, Jurassic Park, he, he will find a way. <laughs> so... Anyway, let's let's we have to get on with a list of players. I I don't know what to make of this Grant Williams situation, other than to say if you were to ask me my my best bench players in the league, he would be one of the first guys that comes to mind, precisely because of his defensive versatility, pre- precisely because of the things we're talking about. Whereas, let's take someone like Christian Wood. Christian Wood has great scoring stats, great counting stats, right? Do you have those up in front of you? I, I you, you made an uh, incredible reaction when I said that. Because when you look at his scoring stats, he 
he looks like a guy who, you know, oh, 24, 25 points per 75, whatever it is, um, positive efficiency. Sometimes he has these big games in, in counting stats. The all-in-ones and the other things don't love him. He's a guy who's made 40% of his wide-open threes, so he can shoot from the outside. He can play that pick-and-pop role. He has some skill in the short role, but I don't. I'm not as quite as enamored with that archetype because I think he gives a ton back defensively. Uh, and I think, I think against really complex defensive situations, he's still a pretty good offensive player, but those numbers probably make him look like a better offensive player than when you get into the nuance of playmaking decisions and short roll outlets and, um, you know, setting screens at different angles and understanding when to slip and playing with a guy like Luca and all that kind of other stuff that just isn't measured by stats. I do think he's, he looks pretty spectacular offensively still. Like I was, I was watching some, some film of him and I think they were playing spectacular, spectacular. I think he makes some spectacular plays, but I'm going to say it. Like, they're like, Indiana throws a double at him. He, like, dribbles. He's doing his thing over in the short corner, spins through the double team, and throws down as a ferocious dunk. I know it doesn't matter much. He's a ferocious dunker for what he is. But I think his off the dribble game is fairly developed. Like, he's not just necessarily like a pick and pop type, type of player. Like, it's not like Ryan Anderson when he was playing next to James Harden. I think some of those skills really lend themselves to being valuable offensive skills. And I won't be surprised when, when they. If they get to the playoffs at this rate, it's a joke, everyone. The Mavericks are going to make the playoffs. But when they make the playoffs, I, I think the offense is going to translate pretty well. I think he's going to be a good scorer with solid efficiency. But like you started off saying, it's the defense to me where I'm like, I, I can't necessarily trust you. You're not a strong rim protector. You don't have the quickest feet. And I think you're going to be targeted to the point where I, I just don't think it's going to be possible to play you out there despite these strong offensive skills you have. Do you want to talk about Bobby Portis at all? Uh, yeah, it doesn't need to be long, but we can talk about Bobby Ben. I mean, he's, 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 he's Bobby D. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's back to coming off the bench this season. Counting stats are the same. He, he's an interesting one because I think he was able to hold up in the playoffs with Milwaukee in the last few years. And in a sense, uh, hold up defensively, I should say. And in a sense, that's been a revelation because what you get with him is a pretty good shooter, right? You get a guy you can play pick and pop. You can play a little pick and roll. He has a little ISO scoring game, face up, mid range, a little out of the post. And he is, this is maybe your point about Christian Wood. He is skilled enough with those offensive moves that when you put him in a playoff setting against good defenses, no, he's not going to be able to pressure defenses and give you 23 points consistently or something like that. But making a couple of those buckets in big games when things get tight in the half court, he'll do that. He'll do that a decent percentage. It's it's a little bit maybe like going back to Ennis Cantor in Oklahoma City or something like that. Like the the offensive part of the equation is actually pretty effective. And then you can hold up on defense versus with Wood, the concern is that you get really, really leaky. You get attacked in pick and roll. You miss rotations, things like that. So yeah, I don't know what else you want to say about about Bobby, but kind of a similar archetype. But I think it was amazing that he was able to hold up, and he's 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 been a uh, what do they say? He's been a find yeah, for Milwaukee. Absolutely. And yeah. according to Marcus Johnson, who calls him Bobby Blitz, because you know the Bucks love doing their drop defense, but when he's in. They mostly go to the hedge just because he's not a great drop defender, but he's actually like a functional hedge defender. Like if we're comparing them directly, I would much rather have Bobby Portis in a defensive system than Christian Wood. He, he can he can move and recover, yeah. I think, better. So so if you're the Milwaukee coaching staff, you can make that adjustment with him. You give up something. Obviously, you're going to give up something when Brooke Lopez and Giannis Antetokounmpo go to the bench, obviously. But you give up something. And then to, to, to Marcus's point on the broadcast, like – you blitz or you hedge, and then he's mobile enough to recover, and you you kind of tread water that way. But then offensively comparing them, Bobby's like off the dribble game isn't there. I would imagine, I, I envisioned his offense as being more like, you know, the pick and pop, the tough shots from the mid-range, the last second ditch, I can make a 17-foot contested jumper and make something out of it. So I think overall, it's still not necessarily going to get you, I think, in the top five uh, six men of the year that we're going to be talking about. But this is still a player that like you can trust in the playoffs because they're not necessarily going to be targeted. 
Okay, let's talk about the guys who we think could get in the top five. Uh, number one, you have Josh Green as the best six man <laughs> in the league, right? I mean, I mean, Ben, he's he's in my list in here. I definitely brought up Josh Green, but we we had a conversation about it because we had like a ethical dilemma. Do we count him as a bench player? I don't know because now he's back on the bench, so I'm not sure what to do. He seemed to be starting. And now, uh, much to my chagrin, Justin Holiday is starting. And I think we already spent way too much time in this show on the entire, um, you know, thing where Grant Williams didn't play in a game. So I don't want to rehash this with Josh Green. But I was anticipating not talking about him when we were discussing this podcast like a week ago in, in preparation of it. But now he's coming off the bench. So I think he would qualify. I think he would qualify as a bench player, Cody. So there's still time. If you want to slip him in front of whoever you have and make the right call for the people, you know, the, the, the Josh Green fanatics out there, the entire country, nay, continent of Australia is looking to get behind you on this one. Uh, there's still time to do it. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I really like Josh Green. We've talked about Josh Green really looking good. He's shooting like 46% on wide open threes this season, right? Enormous improvement. I've won... One thing that's given me pause, but one thing. The last couple of years, minutes per game dropped precipitously in the playoffs. Like, this is a dude that's like, leave him in the corner. Who's this? Let him stay out to drive. Josh Green. Yeah, but that's that's a different man. That's a different Josh Green. That's that, that's, that was that's the youthful Josh Green. Yeah. That was my question to you. Do you think he's he's he has improved enough from last season? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a I think there's a huge jump. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. That was my only pause. Otherwise, Josh Green this season is clearly in the conversation. Okay. Um, th- this is this is an interesting one. Talk to me. They're both small guards, but they're different. It gets back to what you're valuing, not just in the game, but coming off the bench. Norm Powell, who I know you like with the Clippers, and Bruce Brown with the Denver Nuggets. Wow. These are two very different players. I know. Yeah, and I, they are. I think this gets to the difficulty of what you want out of a six man because Norm Powell, I, I like what he brings to the Clippers specifically because they don't necessarily have rim threats. All right. We talked about a little bit when, when we were talking about the enormous Clippers Kings game where they scored 300,000 points together. Norman Powell is like one of three players that knows how to like dribble by defenders and get to the rim. Like when he takes those dribbles and he sees the free throw line, he's not automatically like, I have to pull up for a mid range now. Right. So I like that element of it because he brings a dynamism to their offense that the other players don't have. He brings a shooting ability. Obviously there are other good shooters there, but the driving ability I like, whereas Bruce Brown, Strikes me as more of like a like a skeleton key kind of player. You know, Norman Powell is specifically valuable because he's on the Clippers, but Bruce Brown is like, I bring a lot of these weird elements to the game and the other team isn't going to really know how to handle it because I can do so many different things. I feel like those are the, that's kind of the two sides I see with these two guys. Interesting. I see it as an offense versus defense thing because I think Powell's defense is pretty soft at this point in his career, I think his foot speed on the ball isn't great. Uh, obviously, he's a small body; doesn't really get vertical, protect the paint. He's not gonna he's not gonna be able to hold up on switches against big men and things like that. Whereas Bruce Brown, like Bruce Brown, can defend. Bruce Brown can defend in schemes. He understands what's happening. He can defend on the ball, point of attack. He can rotate. He plays pretty big. What is he listed at? Six three, six. He should. He's like really six nine. We all know. We all know Bruce Brown is a six nine, six three. However, however tall he is in real life. And and for those of you listening out there who are a similar height, Cody, what are you? Six four? Not quite. I'm, 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 okay. I'm a good six three. Six, six, good six three. I'm a good six two. We. You know when you're in this height range, the difference between someone who's actually our height and a tall six. Like, like you'd go up against a guy who's like a tall six three, and you're like, no, you are six nine. You, <laughs> your arms are very long. Your neck is short. I don't know what's happening. We are not the same height when we play basketball. That's Bruce Brown. Um, I should point out when I say offense, defense, Norman Powell is shooting 50% on wide open threes. For the last few years, he he, he is a flamethrower, uh, part of that former Clippers team that had all those shooters before they traded a couple away. But um, yeah, I think I I think I'd rather have Brown right now. I think I would 
I think I'm going in brown. And we're going to do a round robin elimination for me to figure out the best bench players in the league. I think I'd rather have the 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 type of player that Brown is as a better short roll passer. He can cut. He can attack. Um, he's he, Brown himself has improved his three point shooting. We've talked about that. I, I'm I'm feeling Bruce on this one. You know, the audience knows that I will always take an opportunity to plug one of my pet theories. And Bruce Brown, you touched on it right there. Defenses and dimes guy, Ben. Defenses and dimes. I think. C- <laughs> but like he Norman shoots Powell, as well. He shoots threes now. He's he's a three and D. He he's he's not just three and D because he has the passing element. And I think the thing is with like Powell, I think people might imagine him being a better passer. You can get downhill. You can get the kick out. That always looks really sexy when you do it on film. But I really like Bruce Brown's decision making. I think he's a better passer than Powell. And I think that element, man, that's tough to pass up in this sort of situation. So is he three and double D? Is that what you're the, saying? Three and double. I think yeah. officially, yeah. He's Threes, dimes, and defense. Three and double D. Three. And, who else is a three and double D guy? Oh, there's plenty. Of th- Josh Green is a, is a mm. three and double D guy. He can make an extra pass. Uh, Quentin Grimes. Quentin Would, this has turned into a drinking game <laughs> with the number of episodes we can go without mentioning Josh Green or Quentin Grimes. Um, all right, let's do another one. Let's do another round robin. I, this one feels too easy for you. I think it's a fun one to do, though. Tyrese Maxey and Emmanuel Quickly, mm. I think, are very similar stylistic players. Speed, floaters, attack closeouts. Um, some of their statistical footprints are eerily similar on tendencies. Do you think these guys are close, or, or are you still um, you know, team, team Tyrese? Yeah, I'm I'm in the Maxi bag for this one. I I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. It just seems like Maxi does more on the court than quickly. Like they are similar, but I think Maxi better at stampeding, gets the ball, immediately attacks. I like the way that he's able to play off offensive superstars. Uh he could play with either Harden or Embiid, and I think he does a good job. I know they're both great shooters, right? That's definitely something that that uh they both bring to the table. Maxi, I think, is better at creating for his teammates. So I think overall, just because the more things he does for his teammates on the court, I would take Maxi. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. But I should point out that quickly, they both average about 10 drives per 36 minutes. Maxi shoots 53% a true shooting on his drives. Quickly is at 60%. I think Maxi sometimes, and maybe one of the reasons why he ultimately ended up back on the bench and didn't have this explosive sort of third star season is his finishing package. Let's call it that with the little scoops and the offhand stuff. And when he gets downhill, um, I don't know how great it is in conjunction with drawing fouls. Like he doesn't Mm. get to the line quite as much as a guy that has that level of, of burst in him. Right. And, and, Quickly himself is very similar. Neither of them take a ton of free throws. Maxi takes a few more free throws uh, per possession or per, per 75 possessions than quickly. Maxi shoots 40% from the mid range, quickly shoots 47%. So I, I think they're stylistically similar players where Maxi clearly has some strengths and that's allowed him to do more. But as passers, finishers, shooters, all that stuff, I'm actually not sure there's a giant difference there. So I'm comfortable having Maxi ahead, but it's it's interesting to have these these sort of jitterbug guys who feel like they can play a similar role um, with one in Maxi's case moving to the bench. I do wonder with the Sixers, how much his injury had to to do with him coming off the bench now? Because I think they the Sixers have been on quite a roll as of recently, and I think that started when he was injured, and they kind of had a good flow with the Anthony Melton, so I almost wonder if the him coming off the bench, like I was saying at the beginning of the episode, has more to do with Melton just being a better fit next to the other superstars, but I feel like like if you're talking about a, a starter-level player, I, I would rather have Maxi starting than quickly, but I see your point. I, I get where you're coming from. Let's try to rank the Memphis bench players. Um, because this is a team that Someone someone asked me the other day who had the most successful bench in NBA history in terms of, you know, the four or five guys off the bench being able to generate a, a point differential. The the answer is probably something to do with Greg Popovich's Spurs in 2013 or 2014. That's probably the real answer. I don't think there's some super team bench that I'm forgetting in NBA history. But as a joke, I, I said, like the Memphis Grizzlies, like the last the last two years, the Memphis Grizzlies, people are in and out of the starting lineups. It doesn't seem to matter who's 
missing games. Uh, Tyus Jones is a fantastic backup quality point guard for John Morant. Brandon Clark has been in and out of the lineup and played big minutes in big games and playoff series. And he presents his own uh, set of both strengths and weaknesses. And then now, I, I guess Santi Aldama also qualifies for this. He started a little bit early in the year for a stretch, and now he's back off the bench. So a, a number of guys to to pick from in Memphis for this conversation. This hurts, Ben. I'm, I'm going to say something that hurts me in the soul, like deep in my W-shaped soul. Because going, going to UW-Madison, I remember when Duke played in Madison, Tyus Jones was their starting point guard. I hated that man, Ben. I hated him with every fiber in my being. I remember is it, jeering live. Is it, because, is it because he played for Duke? Absolutely. He played yeah. for Duke, but he was also, I'm pretty sure he was part of the team that knocked the Badgers out in the championship game in college uh, basketball. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. That was about the last time I watched college basketball. <laughs> I love Tyus Jones, though, Ben. I, I'm going to say it right now. I think Tyus Jones, um, I know we're probably not ranking yet, but he's my pick for, for my top player for the bench for them. I think he does a tremendous job. I don't think he's like a, a wrecker on defense, but he's functional on defense, right? His rotations are great. He's got good hands. His offense, he doesn't necessarily get all the way to the rim. Like he's not like John ja Morant who just like flies in and throws it down, but he's got that nice little floater game. And I think his passing super underrated. I think he's a great, mm. you know, old school floor general type of point guard. So he's just like, he's the type of guy I want to come into the game and can just control the pace. And I really appreciate what he's able to bring with that. And he's not the, got the off ball shooting game as well. Yeah. I, 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 that's a great call on the, on the passing. He feels like a very, old school style traditional point guard you know we oh, were yeah. talking right I think we were talking recently how, how so few of those are in the game but he's just he's just a steady point guard he can make his threes he can run actions um, he can defend he's a solid he's solid on both sides of the court so I, I would agree with you there I think uh, he would be my pick from Memphis um Let's see. Who does that leave? Who have we not discussed? Oh, do you yeah, want to rank? Ahead. Do you want to rank Brandon Clark and Santi Aldama? I think I would still go with Clark over him. I mean, Santi, of course, his defensive length and versatility is legitimately interesting, especially going forward mm -hmm. in his career. The way he can move is his size, and sometimes he feels like a a helicopter, like a like a <laughs> like a what are they called? Thropters from Dune. Um, that should be Sante Aldama's new nickname, I think, the Thropter. But yeah, I think it's still, I think it's still Clark. I would still go Jones, Clark, Santi at this point. Cody, since we're telling stories of of personal woe, um, personal. do do we count? What do we do with with your favorite player of all time, Matisse Thybul? What do we? How do we count him in this? Oh my god! Or is he just back? Is he back as a starter or is he not worth discussing because he has been sort of sidelined for most of the season? I guess he's, he's, all right, this is a great stat. He, <laughs> he played 49 games in Philadelphia this year. He started six, played 49 games in Philadelphia. He started six. He has played six games in Portland and he has started all six. First of all, crime that he wasn't playing in seven. I'm not even going to talk about that. That's just pay. De'Anthony Melton and Thibel, Ben, that's all I wanted on the court. You can even toss out Paul Reed, and all of a sudden you just have the trifecta of defensive perfect, whatever. And then the Blazers trade Gary Payton Jr. away. So before I can see that combination, I, this is the world is toying with me, and I'm sick of it. But Thibel, he, he started six games. I feel like this is a spiritual starter at this point. So I think okay. I, that's how I feel. Okay, that's fair. I agree with you. I buy that. I do just want to point out that he would technically qualify for the six man of the year award in the NBA going forward. But I do agree with you. I think it's a, a spiritual starter. I think he's probably, probably knock on wood, going to stay in that starting lineup for the last month and change of the season. Um, Larry Nance Jr. How do you feel about him? I love Larry Nance Jr. I love him. What are your thoughts about him? I like him. I like him. I think he's uh I think he's important for them because he allows them to play a more versatile 
uh, defensive coverage and style versus Valanchunas, who's a little more limited, maybe more of that traditional drop. Even though, even though when you get into the when you get into that territory, you switch over to the hedge. You know, the guy if the guy isn't a great rim protector, then we say, well, we're going to double team the ball and recover behind and things like that. But Nance has some rim protection; he can switch offensively. He can finish. He can offensive rebound. He can make a little bit of a short roll pass. He can put it on the floor. Um, yeah, I like him. I like him. I think he's not really great in any, any area. If he were a brown belt in all those areas, he'd be like a all-star, sub-all-star. He's more what's, – what's before a brown belt? He's like a blue belt. He's like a blue belt in a lot of things on the basketball court. Cody, I've once again exceeded your, your cross-sport – References, sorry. No, let's. What what other sport can we do? Listen, this is a one circle Venn diagram, Ben. Like that's it. That's all we're dealing with. Here's what I have to say about th- this. Is basically what you just said. Mario he, Kart. It's maybe Mario Kart. It's. I, I could take Mario Kart references. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a guy that has a lot of bananas, but not necessarily <laughs> a red shell. Man, the OP level of three red shells around you. That's that's like Kevin Durant level. But anyway, with with Nats. He, like you said, he can throw nice pass, passes, but he's not tasked with a lot of passing. He's an efficient scorer, but he's not tasked with a lot of scoring. hes I really like his flexible ability on defense. I think he's a good pick-and-roll defender. He's really good at getting into people's grills and coming back. Secretly, not as good of a rim protector as you would like with that athleticism. But let me ask you the most important question about him. At his peak, who is a better in-game dunker, him or his dad? <sighs> I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say Larry Nance Jr. in-game Larry Nance Senior dunk contest. Yes. Final answer. I agree with that. Larry, if you all haven't seen like mid 2010s Larry Nance Jr. Statue of Liberty dunks, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We're gonna get back into dunk philosophy here for a second. When you watch like Blake Griffin, who's a tremendous in-game dunker, he's got the arm bar right. I remember Paul Gasol being angry about this a couple times. Him shoving him out of the yeah, way. Yeah, he hit him in the. He, he broke down. like broke his face with his elbow. I understand why Pow was upset yeah, about it. Right. Yeah. It's all spectacular. It's a little cheap. Larry Nance Jr. never did that. When he threw down his Statue of Liberties, I'm talking, the arm is straight up, and I think his other arm was like to the side, like he's literally Superman. Incredible Statue of Liberty dunker. You you really were not joking when you said you just want to switch this podcast to just talking about dunking philosophy. Um, let's get back on track. I think he has, he has had... I think he is an important piece for New Orleans and I liked last year both in the play in game situation and in the series against Phoenix like I thought the strengths we're talking about if we're saying he's a blue belt across the board I thought those held up in the playoffs well for a reserve who could also give you looks down the stretch against good teams as a starter um yeah he's we're going to have to figure out who the best of these let's let's talk about two more players unless I'm forgetting anyone um Malcolm Brogdon mm-hmm. of, of the Celtics and a guy I like, we've talked about him a lot from our Sacramento Kings, Malik Monk. He Monk. So Monk gives something back defensively, but offensively kind of a movement shooter plays with tremendous speed and pace. And this is a good time. I think, you know, 40 minutes into the episode or whatever to really get to the meat of what I want to say today, which is speed in basketball, I think is becoming a more relevant attribute, like literally how fast you can run and cut in the same way that when you go to the NFL combine, they're really interested in how fast you go. What kind of, what kind of pace can you create an advantage with? And the Kings, who are so good in transition, one of the fastest teams in the league, um, I think off the top of my head, the most efficient offense in the league in transition, certainly the most efficient offense off of live ball stops, right? Turnovers and misses that get them out uh, quickly. Part of that is speed. Monk is really fast. So when you can run that fast and shoot on the move, and handle and make decisions. Then you can also flow into the two man. You can play handoff. You can create little pocket passes, kick out. He's not a great passer, but he provides some juice on the ball that way. And then um, he's just one of those guys that I feel like I want to go to war with Cody. 
You know, like I trust him in the big moments. In that in that in that Clippers game when it got to the end and Monk was the guy relocating for the three, I was like, this is going down. And one of my favorite things about big shots is when it's one of these players where like he's a good shooter and he loves these big moments. I look for it not to hit the rim. Like like that's how dialed in he was. And I believe that was a dead center bullseye swish. So he's interesting because he's not a great defensive player, but specifically in Sacramento, he along with Herter paired with Fox and Sabonis, that gives them like four really good offensive players. I think if we made a list of the best offensive players, one side only in basketball, um, I don't know how many teams would have like four from the top 50 or 60 or whatever it comes out to, but the Kings do. And I think Monk is one of those guys. That'd be an interesting query to run. Just just using like offensive box plus minus. I wonder what you would get for that. The other part of his athleticism that I really like is he's really good at like contorting his body. Like there's one play during that Clippers game. He gets Plumlee switched on to him, torches him, right? He has has this huge dunk. I don't know where his body was. He was like this way and that way and he landed and it was kind of like this weird injury looking fall. But like, I don't know. I think that's really valuable to kind of be able to just gumby yourself around different players and find those little openings. And I think he's really talented at that. Yeah. Um, Brogdon, on the other hand, well, I should point out with Monk, by the way, because I know, I know you love these kinds of things. If you look at his offensive indicators, 14 drives per 36, 61%. Both of those are in the top quarter of the league. Uh, he's an above average mid range shooter. He's 43% on his wide open threes. And in our model on thinkingbasketball.net, his passer rating is seven. So all of these things kind of come together. But of course, he gives stuff back defensively. Malcolm Brogdon, on the other hand, it doesn't feel like he gives much back defensively. You know this from his Bucks days. Uh, he may not be an all defensive guy, but he is certainly a gritty defender. Um, he's a bigger body. Isn't he like six, four, six, five barefoot? I think think that's what they list him at. Yeah. Yeah. So he's a little bigger. And then he also has a really nice offensive game in, especially in terms of like decision-making closeouts. He's also a really good shooter from multiple levels, the three and the mid range. So he feels like the most, I want to say the most complete guard or perimeter player of anyone we've discussed on this list. He, I think the difference between him and Monk are that Monk kind of brings chaos. He introduces chaos into your offense, right? He can blow by you. He can sprint around, get an open shot that way. I think he's a better passer than Brogdon. I think Brogdon is secretly a pretty, you know, an average passer. I think he makes the right reads, but he's never, or very rarely, I should see, say, going to throw a pass where you're like, oh, wow, that really created a shot out of nothing, right? But he's a steadying presence in the same vein as like a Tyus Jones. I think Tyus Jones is, is much different as a sort of floor general, but he's not going to like, you know, break the ground speed record or anything like that. Not a very fast player, very plays with a good, like at his own pace and he's able to get his own shot off. He can get to the rim. You know, I think that's the element that's really helped the Celtics. I like his ability to touch the paint. Not necessarily a great finisher, able to finish with both hands. He can't sky like Malik Monk. So I think you just have like, I think this might end up having to do with a philosophy. You know, you sound like you're really liking the idea of these guys that can be speedy right? Maybe I'm leaning towards guys in the playoffs that can kind of slow it down a little bit. And I think that's my bias towards Malcolm Brogdon in this conversation. Well, I mean, I don't know how much you need a bias because I think he's, he's fairly well-rounded as a player. And I think he would start on most teams in the league, but maybe not all teams in the league outside of Boston, because there's so many good guards and perimeter players out there. But uh, to me, certainly a starting quality player, that's really good. Okay, I think we have to wrap this show up by we we have to give the people what no no rankings. We have something to do before the rankings. We're missing one player, Ben. We haven't talked about Alex Caruso yet. Oh, Alex Caruso. Yes. Um, boy, what an example of someone who <laughs> just doesn't even shoot the at the basket anymore. He's averaging like yeah. eight points per seventy five possessions. It's incredible. So great defender. Uh, especially at point of attack, of course. And then I would say I like his extra passing and mm-hmm. kind of some of his decision-making, realizing he's he's not much of a scorer. But at the same time, he also feels like a guy who you want him to shoot a little bit better 
than he shoots. You want him to be able to finish and be more um, scoring oriented versus looking to pass when he attacks closeouts or cuts in those situations. Because he does seem to have a really nice feel for stuff when to when to cut, when to make these extra little plays. I think it's one of the things that constantly spikes his value in impact metrics is that he he's doing little things that are hard to pick up in the box score because he has a great intuition for where to go and where to place himself and you know when to backdoor and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, he's he's one of those guys that like you know, you're setting up a table for a meal and you have all the chefs in the kitchen bringing out the food and whatnot. He's basically just bringing silverware, right? And it's you need the silverware to work, but like if you don't have the food, it, there's not really going to be anything that is going to be adding a, a value. So I think he's one of those guys that when you when you bring the scoring, when you bring the creation and all this other stuff, I love his fit in those situations. So I don't know. I don't know. I was really high on him because I like the idea of a player like that that can do the extra passing, that could just be like all over the place on defense. But like you said, he's he's bringing he's actually taking some off the table with his lack of scoring. Yeah, he's actually a below average open shooter at this point. Um, he it never really looks to drive or attack himself, doesn't do a lot to set up teammates. I thought you were going to say, when you start talking about food, as you are wont to do on this show, I, I thought you were going to say he's like the puff pastry of the dinner party, right? Like, like everyone likes him. He brings this one fantastic appetizer angle. Maybe you could put some nutrition in there, depending on what kind of savory treats you want to get into your puff pastry appetizer, but he's not a full meal. He can't he can't be the star of the show. He's gonna get overrun by some kind of protein, spicy finger food thing that's gonna come out next. I, I don't know. That's where I thought you were gonna go. I think maybe even like garlic more than anything, because you can you can cook a meal without garlic. But if you're missing out on the garlic, that's just a flavor yeah. profile that's just taking away from everything. You can cook a meal without garlic. That's my point. You can have a playoff team without Alex Caruso. I didn't know this. I didn't know this. This is this is the news. We have to we have to stop the show so I can uh, learn about how to do this. Um, Malcolm Brogdon, I think number one for me. What do you think? Yep, he's on my. He's number one for me. Yeah, number one. Um, number number two, it gets really hard at number two. I have because I feel like Brogdon is like okay, he can easily be a starter level player and like a good starter in a lot of situations. After that, I'm not really sure what to do. So the easy thing is just to stop the show, and but the but the fun thing is to try to figure out how to get people to yell at us. Uh, number two. <laughs> Are you going to say it then? Are you going to say him? You don't even know what direction I want to go in, do you? Num number two, looking at this board. Um, okay, let me make a prediction. I know you want to say Tyrese Maxey number two. I actually don't, Ben. I don't. Okay, but I don't who know how I feel about my number two right now. Wait, do you have Caruso number two? No, I don't have Caruso number two. Okay. Who do you have number two? I'm going to take. I'm going to make his last second change from my number two to number three. My number two is Tyus Jones. No, I, I don't. I, he's too. He's too like solid for me versus like actually being as good as the other players. Wait, he, does, he doesn't offer. There isn't a value driver for him. What's what's his big value driver? The fact that he's the steadying presence that can <laughs> that can create for his teammates. I love that for him. This is a guy that like the pace comes down. And he's, did you see him last year when John Morant was out? They were just flat out better when John Morant wasn't playing. Like, oh, wow. I don't know, man. Tyus Jones rules. I don't know. What, what, what did those playoff numbers look like last year from him? I, I'm not looking at those numbers right now. Just vibe check. Tyus Jones. Vibe, is my number yeah. Two. Vibe check. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't, honestly, the number two spot feels so open to me. I want to go, I want to get really crazy. I want to get crazy. I want to get crazy and put Malik Monk there. Oh, you have him that high. Well, I don't know. I'm just talking this through. Yeah, I feel like yeah. that's good. I like that. Yeah, I shouldn't react I, that way. I like Malik Monk. I feel like I feel like let's let's get crazy. I feel like Monk and Maxi to me are definitely probably the next guys I'm thinking of in my head. And then, frankly, after that, the the reason why I kind of balked a little at your Tyus Jones, I I think I would rather have. I'm gonna do it. I think I would rather have the Bruce Brown. Hmm. I'll say Bruce Brown, Alex Caruso type on a playoff team. I think that's what I would rather have. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't even know how to argue against it because I can see where you're coming from. <laughs> and at the end of the day, like 
two through seven I could make an argument for. I accept that. I don't I don't necessarily agree with it. Maybe I'm just super Tyus Jones pilled right now, but I'll I'll accept that. You're you're good with that. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Is anyone gonna get mad that we didn't mention Russell Westbrook? Why did you have to mention Russell Westbrook? I just realized I'm, he was going to win six man of the year, probably until he got until he got traded, right? No, now, now we actually have to talk about him because this is all your fault. No, we can just wrap up the show. We can do one of our famous outros, you know, to to support the show. Check out patreon.com slash thinking basketball. That's where we get the stats that we talk. We're looking at the player cards as we do this so we can reference the drives and the shooting and all the all in one stats that you want to eat in your cereal. Wouldn't that be a cool cereal? Like if someone made a advanced stat cereal and you remember the cereals had little words in them back in the day, you could have an RAPM and an EPM and your cereal could, I don't even eat cereal. Would, what am I would talking they be about? The, the marshmallows? Like there'd be the little grain things and then the marshmallows, it would be like the name of a stat. Yeah. Um, well, your marshmallow would probably have to be true shooting percentage. That's a TS, TS percentage sign. Maybe the marshmallows could just be percentage signs. <laughs> This is what happens at the end of the show. So, no, I'm saying, you know, if you have anything else, now's the time to slip it in. Otherwise, we can get out of here. I think Larry Nance Jr. is pretty high for me in this conversation, too. Yeah, he, yeah I'm looking at this board, yeah. and I think Larry Nance Jr. is also pretty high. I, I think don't sleep on quickly. He's mm-hmm. a solid player. and um, I'm high on Grant Williams, too. Bad. And then Grant Williams, <laughs> yeah. That's probably, if I had to make a top 10, those guys would probably be in it. So... Um, yeah, hope, hope, hope you enjoyed this one. Thanks as always for, for listening all the way through. And of course, whether you're eating garlic, I need, I need an instructional lesson on how to do this without garlic. You're garlic free or you're pro garlic. I don't know, but either way, I absolutely hope that you are having a great day. 